Hello, everybody. I'm Hava Willick Levy, and I am delighted to have a guest with me today who I'm probably going to make her blush, but she is a luminary in the disability rights movement and um, somebody who has truly made the world a different and better place for people with disabilities. Her name is Judy Human, and uh, she uh, just, there's so many things one can say, but I, I'll just summarize that her work in activist organizations uh, across the country and then um, as policy um, creators in federal government uh, working under the Clinton and Obama administrations um, has really made a difference nationally and internationally. Um, and without further ado, Judy Human, welcome to Breathtaking. Thank you so much. I appreciate this, Clara. Such a pleasure. We go back a long way, but- Someone we, asked me when we first met. I'm like, I have no idea. Many, was, many, many years ago. Do you remember when? Yeah, we were in our 20s and it was when DIA was just starting. Disabled, disabled in action. In the early 70s. Yes, yes. Wow. A lot, of, a lot of water under the bridge. A lot and over the bridge. <laughs> Absolutely. So we, we are actually going to be having three um, conversations that will be uh, uploaded during one week's time, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, the date to be determined, but I'll certainly be letting everyone know. Um, the first uh, part of this conversation is on the heels of the recent 30th anniversary celebration of when the, the ADA was signed into law, Americans with Disabilities Act. And I wanted to ask you, because I'm convinced many people don't know the answer to this. What was life like before the ADA became law? So thank you very much, Kava. This year, July 26, 2020, was the 30th anniversary of the ADA. And I think your question is great because first of all, many people don't even know what the ADA is. We'd like to believe that everybody does know what the Americans with Disabilities Act is, but I continually speak with younger disabled individuals, for example, who are becoming advocates and almost to a person, they didn't know what the ADA was or Section 504 until they were over 15 or 18 or 20 or older. So I think that's a very important point that we can get in discussing more later, but what existed before the ADA in 1990 um, is something that you and I can also both speak about. We both grew up in New York City and, you know, our families lived there um, for many different reasons. One of them, my family was from Germany and we're Jewish and a lot of people, Jewish Jews from uh, sorry, German Jewish uh, people from Germany and Europe lived in New York City and live in New York City or the surrounding area. And um, it was a metropolitan area, still is a metropolitan area. And so on the one hand, one of the reasons why people gravitated to a metropolitan area was great public transportation, great services, stores, lots of conveniences, reasonably nearby, not necessarily needing a car um, to get around, and lots of schools and lots of universities and religious schools if you wanted to go to those. But if you had a disability, particularly now I'm talking about physical disabilities, we can talk about others, but for the moment talking about myself and you, like what life was like before, uh, life before Section 504, life before major laws were passed in New York City and New York State, 
and certainly before the ADA in 1990. Um, when I was younger growing up, you didn't really hear people talk a lot about discrimination. It was just things were not accessible. And it wasn't that people had thought about making buses and trains and sidewalks accessible and schools and universities accessible. Um, that wasn't really something that was being discussed. So most people didn't see it as, oh, wow, we need to do something about this. Look at all these people who can't benefit. Um, I think really the end of the Second World War allowed that discussion to begin to slowly happen uh, with veterans organizations like Paralyzed Veterans of America and for those of us in New York, Eastern Paralyzed Veterans Association. And EPVA really um, in the 50s and 60s moving forward was one of the first groups that really was addressing the issue of accessibility in a more comprehensive way at the city and state level. But I couldn't get around anywhere. Um, I couldn't drive. And so I was really very dependent on my family and friends. Um, and what we could call today paratransit, but it wasn't really paratransit, it was private companies. So when I, for example, when I got my first job um, as a teacher, um, the school that I was assigned to, I couldn't get there walking. This was after a lawsuit where I'd been denied the right to teach, had a sue to get my teaching license. So, you know, no laws making it illegal to discriminate against a qualified person like we later um, had seen coming into uh, fruition, both for 504 and the ADA. And I was paying every day, I think like on a monthly basis, I was paying like two, three hundred dollars a month to go to and from work. Yeah. I wasn't earning that big a salary. Yep. So, and you know, you saw early just on. Out of curiosity, I don't know if, about you, but when I began working um, and needed to pay taxis, um, just even to get the taxi, like they didn't want to come. They, you know, they, they knew you were a wheelchair user. They knew I was a wheelchair user and they would simply say, I don't want to be bothered. And so like every morning would become this nightmare of trying to just get somebody to get me to work. And of course, our taxes were paying for public transportation, but we were not allowed to benefit from it. Well, I guess you could stand or transfer into a taxi. At, at the time, I was able to. Yeah, yeah, so I couldn't. So I couldn't use taxis. I had to use private companies. They weren't run by the city. Kind and, of like, um, ambu like Ambulet? Yeah, things like that. And so they were, they are, and they were expensive. And I couldn't deduct it. I actually tried to deduct my transportation to and from work, arguing that my wheelchair was a tool. So if you were a painter and you needed to bring your paint to your, from your house to your job, you could in fact take that off as a tax deduction. Hmm. But a wheelchair was not considered a tool for me to be able to perform my job. And therefore I could not take it off as a tax deduction. So, um, you know, all those types of things. And then, you know, sometimes they didn't show up a couple of times over the three years I was teaching, I literally had to get um, the police to help me um, get someone to open the door to the school because instead of getting picked up at four o'clock, I had vehicles that came as late as five or six and I had no way of getting home um, if they didn't show up because no accessible taxis, no accessible buses, no accessible anything including curb cuts. So 
that's like one example. And I think what's important about the multiple examples that we could all give is the fact that it was demeaning and really, I think, necessitated a mind change from you and me and thousands and millions of other disabled people around the United States to begin to say that it was not accessible, acceptable that our, as you were referencing, our tax money is being used for public transportation as an example, and yet it's not accessible. And we want to work and we need to work like everybody else, but there were, and in many ways still, are very limited accommodations to um, what it is we need. You know, looking at this today, when we look at COVID, so I live in Washington, D.C. now, and one of the things that is an is, is a increasing issue is the lack of availability of accessible taxis. So it turns out that on a regular day in D.C. pre-COVID, there were like 3,000 taxis a day on the street. Today, there are 300. Wow. So you can see, I'm sure it's similar in New York, you can see that the effect of COVID on daily life for those of us with more significant transportation, in, uh, sorry, more significant disabilities is um, going to continue to have a serious impact on our lives in spite of the laws. So the laws say you can't discriminate. So them refusing to take you because you had a disability now would clearly be an act of discrimination. But if there's no taxi available, then there's no discrimination based on disability. It's a bigger issue that exists for the entire community. So I think what existed before was a very limited disability rights movement, one that was not uh, cross disability, that did not represent the racial diversity of the communities. I think that is slowly changing. And we also have seen many laws now as a result of very strong efforts on the part of disabled individuals and allies to um, be expanding our movement and would you hand me my book? Okay. Sorry, I'd get somebody to pick up my book. Um, so I would say those are some of the before and afters. I think the before was limited respect for ourselves until we decided that we were going to be the leaders of our movement, moving away from the medical model and looking at us as hopeless. I mean, hopeless, helpless objects of pity and uh, saying that we were like everybody else if we were given equal opportunities. And so I think that those are some of the substantive changes that our movement is resulting in. Can you remember maybe a, a, a beginning point in your life, a turning point where you said, I now subscribe to these, what at the time were revolutionary ideas, like, the, like rejecting the medical model, which is saying, oh, that person, yes, she's, she's disabled, she's, I guess they'd say handicapped, and you know, it's a, she has a medical problem, um, she's a patient, if you will. Like, can you think of a point where something shifted for you and you knew that your purpose in life was to counter all of these misconceptions? I mean, I think um, when I was denied my teaching license, specifically in writing, that said I was denied my license because of paralysis of both lower extremities, sequelae of poliomyelitis. I think that was a turning point for me 
over a couple of month period of time. I mean, when I got the letter, I knew that this was wrong, but making the decision that I was going to try to do something to litigate and address this issue uh, took me a little bit of time both to think about it um, and then to find an attorney who would be able to represent me. So I would say that was definitely a monumental time. And that was in like 1970. Um, I think when I was going to camp in the 60s, being able to be with other disabled individuals was uh, helping me form my thinking, not just as an individual, but beginning to allow us to see the value of doing things together. So when Disabled in Action was formed in the 1970, I think that also was, you know, a very exciting, I mean, the whole planning of it was very exciting because a group of us came together and said, you know, we want to start an organization that's run by disabled individuals, not run by non-disabled people. And that the purpose of the organization will be straight up advocacy. Um, no medical research, no any of this other stuff, but we wanted to really set up a group run by disabled people with different types of disabilities that had a broad agenda um, to address a whole host of issues in the area of discrimination. And I think, you know, really for me personally, um, every little successful thing that we were able to do and we are able to do uh, makes me feel stronger. And even when we're not successful or not as successful as we would like to be, being able to look at what the future is gonna be and how we need to have an impact on it. And for me, it's really been, you know, my whole life that I've seen this as a movement. I didn't call it a movement, you know, in the 60s, but as, you know, we moved into the 70s, we really began to call it a movement. And we were learning from the women's movement, the civil rights movements, others that were using the word movement and the word discrimination. So I think that for me also was very important to begin to label ac actions that were based on denying us opportunities before because of our disabilities. I think all those things have been very important in my life. And I feel like I own that very early on, as did, you know, my colleagues. We were really, you know, the DIA crowd was all about discrimination and ending discrimination and calling it discrimination. I want to pick up on something you said in passing. You mentioned about the camp that you went to. And I know that, of course, now there is a film about the camp, and you're in this film, and that, if I understand it cor correctly, it is shortlisted for an Academy Award, I believe. Not yet. Not quite yet, but it is hopeful that it will be. Can you just te tell, us, tell us, uh, for those of us who don't know, just give us a word or two about the movie? So you can all see the movie. It's a Netflix film and you can see it on Netflix. It's called Crip Camp. And it was um, the vision of a gentleman named Jimmy Lebrecht, who was from Westchester, who went to the camp. And when you see the film, you'll see him. He's the first really cute guy in a wheelchair coming down a ramp. I laugh every time I see him in that film. Um, he's a sound engineer. Uh, an award-winning sound engineer and um, went, left New York and went to graduate school in California in San Diego. And uh, over the course of, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, 
21st century, et cetera, he was um, building up his repertoire in sound engineering, had his own company and was doing work with um, a woman named Nicole Noonan. And the two of them ultimately became the directors for this film, Crip Camp. Um, Jimmy, a number of years ago, uh, remembered that there was some footage that had been taken at Camp Jeanette in 1971. And it was the result of two men who lived in Hunter, New York, who had started a nonprofit organization um, that was using video cameras. And they brought a couple of video cameras to the camp um, and said the campers could like experiment and learn how to use a video camera. And it, Jimmy, they didn't find the people who had the film, the footage until I guess, 2015 or 16. And uh, Jimmy had decided that he wanted to do a film about the camp. And then what they were able to do is, it's a documentary. I think you all should try to watch it. It's in 29 languages. It's audio described in 19. And uh, it's about a number of us who went to camp and then it moves from camp experience. I was 21 or two when the footage took place. I was already teaching. And um, a number of other people who uh, went to the camp, all of us who eventually moved to Berkeley. I moved there first and then a bunch of other people. And I would say the film is an excellent documentary because it shows the changes that went on between the early 1970s and really uh, 2019 um, and has some excellent footage, not just from the camp, but excellent footage of other events that were going on. And it brings forth the voices of many disabled individuals to um, also really speak to both our individual lives and what we were experiencing, and then looking at a significant focus on the 504 demonstrations in 1977, and then moving forward um, to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And- uh, Judy, would, would you take a moment again? I, you know, for me, those 504 demonstrations, uh, you know, they are, a story that must be told. And I know we don't have, um, you know, all the time because each, each of our interviews I know has some limitation. I think we're still fine, but I'd hate to miss the chance uh, to give our listeners and viewers um, from you, what exactly was this thing called the 504 uh, sit-in in particular? So let me say a couple of quick things. Um, you can go to YouTube and look up something called The Power of 504. That's an 18 minute documentary on just the demonstrations. And then in Netflix, you'll see it reasonably represented. What it basically was is in 1972, the, 1973 ultimately, the Rehabilitation Act was signed into law and it had and has in it something called Title V. In Title V, there is something called Section 504. Section 504 says you may not discriminate against someone with a disability if you are a recipient of federal financial assistance. And um, there had been much work that had gone on between 1973 and 1977 to get the regulations developed. Um, the Department of Health, Education and Welfare Office of Civil Rights had been working across the United States, uh, learning more about the kinds of discrimination people were experiencing and the kinds of regulations that needed to be developed that would be non-discriminatory, protecting the rights of disabled people, but on the same token, not require, for example, 
that all existing schools and universities, all of which were getting some money from the federal government, would have to be made accessible overnight, likewise for hospitals and others. So um, the regulations were not signed by Gerald Ford. And when Jimmy Carter came in, he had said that he would have the regulations signed. And basically what happened, there was a group called the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities. It was started in 1975. Um, in 1977, it was led by uh, the ch uh, chairperson of the board was a woman named Eunice Fiorito, who came from Chicago to New York to DC and a blind woman, a very strong leader advocate. She was my boss. <laughs> oh, she was your boss, so you can talk about her. You're a very uh, powerful woman. Very powerful woman. And uh, I was on the board. And we decided in February of 1977 that if the regulations were not signed by April of 1977, that there would be demonstrations around the country. The Bay Area, Berkeley, San Francisco, at that point, I had moved out there in 1973, was much more organized than other parts of the country, which really enabled us uh, when the demonstrations and rallies were held on April 5th uh, to bring together a large group of people, not just disabled people, but supporters from labor unions, religious community, um, women's organizations, on and on. And we had a meeting with the regional director. We went into the building with an, an appointment uh, to meet with him. And the bottom line is he knew nothing about the regulations. He knew nothing about what was happening. And so we decided to stay overnight. And um, the group in Washington stayed overnight, but they left the next day because they were denied food and medicine and people left. But we decided to stay. And then we decided to continue to stay. And basically what happened was 150 disabled people and some allies were in the building. On the fourth floor, the regional office for health, education, and welfare um, for about 26, 27 days. And uh, it was an amazing experience. About 22, 25 of us left San Francisco, came back to Washington, DC. We were supported by the Machinist Union who helped us get around to meetings all over the city. Um, we met up with other people from ACCD in DC and from other parts of the country and held meetings in the White House and demonstrated outside of Jimmy Carter's church and Joe Califano's house. And ultimately, you know, we're meeting with congressmen and senators. Ultimately, the regulations were signed as they were the day we started the demonstration, which is what we wanted. And there were serious discussions going on about weakening the proposed regulations, but we prevailed because there was such a strong movement of disabled individuals who really had said enough is enough. And I think that for many of us, was an incredibly empowering experience. Whether or not you were in the building, people were experiencing a sense of justice um, that we hadn't experienced before. Um, obviously nothing changes overnight, but the ability to get those regulations signed as they were in that, at that time, to do, get money from the federal government, to do trainings around the United States, both to disabled individuals and to poor recipients of federal money. All of that was very important and really the precursor to being able to do the Eight Americans with Disabilities Act. Looking, looking ahead now, uh, yes, 30 years of the ADA certainly 
has given us much, but clearly, clearly there's so much more that needs to be done. I wondered be, as we begin wrapping up, what are, um, what, what is the most important battle that you feel needs to be won? Well, I guess if I have to do one, it's win the election in November. I'm a very strong Democrat and I really am deeply concerned that if the current person in office wins election again, he, the number of judges that they've been able to appoint that will serve terms for their entire lives, who are not necessarily our friends, both the dismantling of civil rights laws um, in the area of disability and other areas is a deep concern to me. I mean, you can see things like what they're doing with the census, which is gonna have a profound impact on cities. If what, there is- an I'm sorry for my ignorance. What, 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 what's happening with the census? They're reducing the amount of time that they're gonna be taking to gather census data by one month. So that will absolutely have an adverse effect if they prevail on getting accurate numbers, uh, which means the number of representatives in the House, the amount of money that the federal government gives to states based on the numbers of people living in the states. Those are all very significant concerns. Hmm. The Supreme Court, um, you know, there will be one or two vacancies, definitely likely one over the next year. Um, and it's the Senate that um, confirms Supreme Court justices. So I think the election, people voting, issues around the suppression of voting, um, disenfranchising for black and brown, disabled and non-disabled people, these are all major concerns. The policies that are in existence against immigrants in the United States, um, all of these things are my deepest concern because we need to take control of the Senate. We need to get the presidency back in order for us really to be able to dig ourselves out of this terrible coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, and in my mind, much of this was preventable, but the leadership or lack thereof at the federal level is causing an increasing number of people dying and our being, you know, the worst country in the world on uh, cases and deaths. Hmm. How, I, what, um, what actions are you personally and various um, national conglomerate organizations doing to shift things away from this very sad reality? Well, I think programs like Rev Up run through the American Association of People with Disabilities are very important. People can go to the AAPD, American Association of People with Disabilities website, learn more about Rev Up. I think looking at what's going on within uh, your city, county, town, state is very important. Getting people registered to vote, helping make sure that people actually do vote. Um, all those things are very important and we need to be not just working with the disability community, but in alignment with other civil rights organizations to uh, really um, ensure that people are registered to vote and vote. This has been an eye-opener for me. I thought I knew quite a lot, and I see that, frankly, there's quite a lot I need to do some homework on. So I, I very much appreciate this. Um, I'm going to um, draw, you know, bring this uh, conversation to a close, but we will be uh, picking up with a second podcast uh, in which we will discuss your phenomenal book, great title, being human. Um, so for now, Judy, thank you. 
thank you for your insights and your wisdom and, and your leadership. Thank you, Chava. Bye, everybody. See you soon. Bye.